Chapter 7 of The Sword and Stone by T.H. White. Tilting and horsemanship had two afternoons a week because they were easily the most important branches of a gentleman's education in those days. Merlin grumbled a good deal about athletics, saying that nowadays people seem to think that you were an educated man if you could knock another man off a horse, and that the craze for games was the ruination of true scholarship. Nobody got scholarship like they used to do when he was a boy, and all the public schools had been forced to lower their standards, but Sir Ector, who was an old tilting blue, said that the Battle of Cressy had been won upon the playing field of Cam fields of Camelot. This made Merlin so furious that he gave Sir Ector rheumatism two nights running before he relented. Tilting was a great art and needed an enormous amount of practice. When two knights jousted, they held their lances in their right hands, but they directed their horses at one another so that each man had his opposite on his near side. The base of the lance, in fact, was held on the opposite side of the body to the side at which the enemy was charging. This seemed rather inside out to anybody who has who is in the habit, say, of opening gates with a hunting crop, but it has its reasons. For one thing, it meant that the shield was on the left arm, so that the opponents charged shield to shield, fully covered. It also meant that a man could be unhorsed with the side or edge of the lance in a kind of horizontal swipe, if you did not feel sure of hitting him with your point. This was the humblest and least skillful blow in jousting. A good jouster, like Lancelot or Tristram, always used the blow of the point, because, although it was liable to miss in unskilled hands, it made contact sooner. If one knight charged with his lance held rigidly sideways, with a view to sweeping his opponent out of the saddle, the other knight, with his lance held directly forward, would knock him down a lance length before the sweep came into effect. Then there was how to hold your lance for the point of stroke. It was no good crouching in the saddle and clutching it in the, in the rigid grip preparatory to the great shock if you held it inflexibly like one of like its point buckled up and down to every movement of your thundering mount, and you were practically certain to miss your aim. On the contrary, you had to sit loosely in the saddle with the lance easy and balanced against the horse's motion. It was not until the actual moment of striking that you clamped your knees into the horse's sides, threw your weight forward in your seat, clutched the lance with the whole hand instead of with your fingers and thumb, and hugged your right elbow to your, to your side to support its butt. There was the size of the spear. Obviously a man with a spear 100 yards long would strike down an opponent with, normal spe with a normal spear of 10 or 12 feet before the latter came anywhere near him but it would have been impossible to make a spear 100 yards long and, if made, impossible to carry it. The jouster had to find out the greatest length which he could manage with the greatest speed and stick to that. Sir Lancelot, who came some time after this story, had several sizes of spear and would call them his great spear and his lesser spear, as occasion demanded. There were the places on which the enemy should be hit. In the armory of the castle of the forest Savage, there is a big picture of a knight in armor with circles round his vulnerable portions. These varied with the style of armor so that you had to study your opponent before the charge and select a point. The good armorers, the best lived in Warrington and still live there, were careful to make all the forward or entering sides of their suits convex so that when a spear pointed glanced at them, so that when a spear so that a spear point glanced off them, Curiously enough, the shields were more inclined to be concave. It was better that a, spear, that a spear point should stay on your shield rather than glance off upwards or downwards and perhaps hit a more vulnerable point of your body armor. The best place of all for hunting people was on the very crest of the tilting helm. The best place of all for hitting people was on the very crest of the tilting helm. That is, if the person in question were vain enough to have a large metal crest in whose folds ornaments the point would find ready, already lodging. Many were vain enough to have these armorial crusts, crests, with bears and dragons or even ships or castles on them, but Sir Lancelot always contented himself with a bear helmet or a bunch of feathers which would not hold spears or, on one occasion, a soft lady's sleeve.
It would take too long to go into all the interesting details of proper tilting, which the boys had to learn, for in those days one had to be master of one's craft from the bottom upward. You had to know what wood was best for spears and why, and even how to turn them so that they would not splinter or warp. There were a thousand disputed questions about arms and armor, all of which had to be understood. Just outside Sir Ector's castle there was a jousting field for tournaments. Although there had been no tournaments on it since Kay was born, it was a green meadow kept short with a broad grassy bank raised around it on which pavilions could be erected. There was an old wooden grandstand at one side, lifted on stilts for the ladies. At present it was only used as a practice ground for tilting. So a quintain had been erected at one end of the ring, on, at one end and a ring on the other. The quintain was a very horrible wooden saccharine on a pole. He was painted with a bright blue face and a red beard and glaring eyes. He had a shield in his left hand and a flat wooden sword in his right. If you hit him in the middle of his forehead, all was well. But if your lance struck him on the shield or at any part left or right of the middle line, then he spun round with, a, with great rapidity and usually, usually caught you a wallop with his sword as you galloped by, ducking. His paint was somewhat scratched, and on the wood picked up and the wood picked up over his right ear. The ring was just an ordinary iron ring, tied to a kind of gallows by a thread. If you managed to put your point through the ring, the thread broke, and you could canter off proudly with the ring round your spear. The day was cooler than it had been for some time, for the autumn was almost within sight, and the two boys were in the tilting yard with the master and with the master armorer and Merlin. The master armorer or sergeant at arms was a stiff, pale, bouncy gentleman with met with wax mustaches. He always marched about with his chest stuck out like a point like a powder pigeon, and called out, "On the word one." On every possible occasion, he took great pains to keep his tummy in, and often tripped over his feet because he could not see them over his chest. He was always making his muscles ripple, which annoyed Merlin. Wart lay beside Merlin in the saddle of the grandstand, and scratched himself for harvest bugs. The saw-like sickles had only lately been put away, and the wheat stood in, stuck, in stalks of eight among the tall stubble of, of those times. The wart still itched. He was also sore about the shoulder and the burning red ear from making, bo from making boss shots at the quintain, for, of course, practice tilting was done without armor. Wart was pleased that it was Kay's turn to go through it now, and lay drowsily in the shade, snoozing, scratching, twitching like a dog, and partly attending the fun. Merlin, sitting with his back to all this athletic Merlin, sitting with his back to all this athleticism, was practicing a spell which he had forgotten. It was a spell to make the sergeant's mustaches uncurl, but at present it only uncurled one of them, and the sergeant had not noticed it. He absentmindedly curled it up again every time that Merlin did the spell, and Merlin said, Drat it! and began again. Once he made the sergeant's ears flat by mistake, and the latter gave a startled look at the sky. "'How's Goat?' asked Merlin lazily, getting tired of these activities. They had set free all of Madame Mim's poor captives on the night of the great duel, but the Goat had insisted on coming home with them. They found him lurking on the edge of the battleground, having galloped all the way back to see the fun, and to help the wart as best he could if Madame Mim should have proved the victor. "'He's made friends with Cavill,' said the wart, "'and decided to sleep in the kennels.' It was funny at first, because Clumsy and Apollon thought it was cheek and tried to run him out. He just stood in the corner so that they could nip his hocks, so that they could not nip his hocks, and gave them such a bunt, each with his knobbly forehead, that now, whenever he gives them one of his looks, they get up from wherever that whatever they are doing and go somewhere else. The dog boy says Clumsy believes he is the devil. From far off on the other side of the tilting ground, the sergeant's voice came floating in the air still. No, nah, no, nah, Master K, that's not it at all. Has you were, has you were, the spear should be held between the thumb and forefinger of the right hand, and the shield in line with the seam of the thrasher leg. The wart rubbed his sore ear inside. What are you grieving about now, said Merlin. 
I wasn't grieving. I was just thinking. What were you thinking? Oh, it wasn't anything. I was thinking about Kay learning to be a knight. And well, you may grieve, said Merlin, haste, said Merlin hotly. A lot of brainless unicorns swaggering about and calling themselves educated just because they can push each other off a horse with a bit of a stick. It makes me tired. Why, I believe Sir Ector would have been gladder to get by to get a by our lady tilting blue for your tutor than swing himself along that swings himself along on his knuckles like an anthropoid ape rather than a magician of known problem of known probity an international reputation with first class honors from every European university. The trouble with the English aristocracy is that they are games mad. That's what it is, games mad. He broke off indignantly and deliberately made the sergeant's ears flap slowly twice in unison. I wasn't thinking quite about that, said the wart. As a matter of fact, I was thinking how nice it would be to be a knight like Kay. Well, you'll be one soon enough, won't you? asked Merlin impatiently. The wart did not answer. Won't you? Merlin turned round and looked directly at the wart through his spectacles. What's the matter now? said Merlin, in his nastiest voice. His inspection had shown him that the wart was trying not to cry, but that if he spoke in a kind voice, the wart would break down and do it. "'I shall not be a knight,' replied the wart coldly. Merlin's trick had worked, and he no longer wanted to weep. He wanted to kick Merlin. "'I shall not be a knight, because I am not a proper son of Sir Ector's. They will knight Kay, and I shall be his squire.' Merlin's back was turned again, but his eyes twinkled behind his curious spectacles. "'That's too bad,' said Merlin, without commiseration. The wart burst out with all his thoughts aloud. "'Oh!' he cried. "'But I should have liked to have been born with a proper father and mother "'so that I could be a knight-errant. "'What would you have done? "'I should have had a splendid suit of armour "'and dozens of spears and a black horse standing eighteen hands, "'and I should have called myself the Black Knight, "'and I should have ho hoved as well.' or ford, or something that made all true knights that came that way, or joust with me for the honour of their ladies, that I should have spared them all after I had given them a great fall, and I should live out of doors all the year round in a pavilion, and never do anything but joust and go on quests, and bear away the prize at tournaments, and I shan't ever tell anybody my name. Your wife won't enjoy that life very much, said Merwin reflectively. Oh, I'm not going to have a wife. I think they're stupid. I shall, I shall have a lady love, though, added the wart uncomfortably. But I can wear her favour on my helm and do so. I can wear her favour on my helm and do deeds in her honour. Would you like to see some real knight errands? Asked Merlin slowly. For this now, for the sake of your education. Oh, I would! Cried the wart. We've never, we've never even had a tournament since I was here. I suppose it could be managed. Oh, please do. You could take me to some if you did the as you did to the fish. I suppose it's educational in a way. It's very educational," said the wart. "I can't think of anything more educational than to see some real knights fighting. Oh, won't you please do it?" Do you prefer any particular knights? King Pelinor, said the ward immediately. He had a weakness for the gentleman since the strange encounter in the forest sauvage. And we will pause there.